Hello, everyone. Uh, as you have heard, uh, I'm from TCL Research Europe, which is a new R&D center. We started in August here in Warsaw. Uh, and uh, we are mostly focusing on the AI, actually only on the AI methods, and mostly in the area of computer vision, because TCL is a, is a big manufacturer, Chinese manufacturer of smart TVs and smartphones as well. Uh, and I would like to present you uh, one, of our, uh, one of our projects, uh, namely in painting. Uh, and the plan is simple, so first I will tell you uh, in simple words what in painting is, and uh, I will try to show you why it is inter interesting. Uh, then I will, uh, tell, uh, uh, I will show you one uh, sample approach based on deep learning. deep learning. This is the one that we are building on uh, in our project. I will also mention about some other approaches and modifications, possible modifications. Then I will also say a few words about some practical issues that we encountered during, during the project. Uh, and I will, I will show some sample results and summarize at the end. Uh, so let me start. Uh, what, is, what actually is in painting? Uh, so so the, the answer is uh, quite, quite simple. So it is a process of reconstructing lost of deteri deteriorated uh, parts of images or videos. Uh, so like in this example, we have an input image, then we put some mask on it, and we are trying to reconstruct the missing parts of the image uh, basing on the neighborhood. Uh, so that's more or less the topic. And why it's interesting? So the first answer is, uh, it was on NIPS, recent, uh, on recent NIPS conference. NIPS is a top AI conference, so it's the answer itself. It's, if it's on NIPS, then uh, okay, it has to be interesting. But uh, believe me or not, there are some other reasons, <laughs> so and other applications useful. So, for example, it can be used to restore uh, old uh, old photos or videos. Like here, we have some defects on a on a photo. We can put a mask on it and then uh, try to restore what the photo should like without without the defect. Uh, another application, obvious one, is uh, automatic scene editing uh, and retouching. So, for example, we have some uh, photos with with objects. We want to remove the objects, so we put, put the mask on objects, and then we have a clear photo without, without the objects on it. Uh, there are also some other applications, like uh, in painting can be used uh, for denoising as well. Uh, so as a kind of a side effect, uh, the in painting results tend to be uh, smooth, uh, even if, we, we, if, even if uh, we put the noisy input. Uh, and there are works working on it, on, on it and uh, trying to figure out what the mask should look like to, to achieve a good denoising uh, result. But I will not focus on that. Uh, also, it can be used for uh, compression. So here are some uh, interesting, uh, interesting results. So from the only the 5% of uh, pixels, of course, if we choose those pixels in a smart way, we are able to reconstruct uh, the whole image. Uh, so, uh, yes, it can be used uh, for compression cl clearly here. Uh, also, I was considering to, to remove it, but uh, we have a weekend after all, so let's also talk about entertainment. So, this is a, uh, there, was a re there was a recent mo model published uh, which uh, uh, does uncensoring of images. In particular, we can uh, do uncensoring, uncensoring of uh, Japanese animations, like, like here, and reveal some reveal some interesting details out of, out of the censored images. Uh, so, okay, now I, I, I hope you are convinced that this is an important problem. Uh, so let me, <laughs> uh, let me start uh, with describing how we can solve it, solve it with deep learning. Uh, our baseline approach is based on the NVIDIA's paper, quite recent one, introducing partial convolutions. So I will tell about these partial convolutions and describe the whole, the whole, the whole pipeline of training uh, in painting model. Uh, but let, let me start with the, with the answer to the question, why deep learning? So uh, there exist many, many classical methods uh, to, to do the in-painting based on example-based example in, pa in painting or some patches. Uh, um, and there are also commercial solutions like uh, Adobe, of course, is working on it. Uh, they, they work pretty well, uh, but uh, also they have, they have some problems. Uh, so first of all, it's hard to be accepted to NIPS if you don't do the deep learning. So this is one reason to, 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 do this, to do this with deep learning, if you want to go to NIPS. But again, there are other, uh, other uh, reasons as well. Uh, so traditional, traditional methods, they usually work well uh, for 
specific tasks, like for example, background in painting, when you can just simply repeat some patches from the neighborhood to reconstruct the, the missing part. Uh, and they have problems with, uh, let's say, hallucinating uh, the, the missing content uh, if we are talking about challenging tasks like complex objects or faces, for example. And deep learning, uh, in contrast, does quite well because uh, it also captures some high-level semantics of images. And for example, here you can see this is output fr from our model where we, uh, we, we are able to reconstruct uh, face realistically. So if, we, if you use traditional methods, then probably this would not look like a face anymore. Okay, so how to, how to do this step by step? First of all, uh, we need the training data. And it's quite, this is a good news, it's quite simple to get the data because we can use any photos actually. So we can use any existing databases like ImageNet, Places and so on, or any kind of photos. Uh, you, the, the, the simplest option is to simply generate some random masks like this one. Uh, and try to learn to, to restore the missing parts uh, of, the, of, the, of the images. Uh, one important thing here to mention is that masks do matter. So for example, in the original paper that I mentioned, uh, they proposed a way to, uh, to create diversified uh, masks because they need to be diversi diversified during training as much as possible. So they, they are, have different shapes, they cover the different uh, area of, areas of the image uh, and so on. Uh, and also, it is also worth, worth considering to use some specialized masks, like masks put on some face landmarks or on objects. I will mention about it later as well. So when we have masks, uh, we have data training data, we have images, what we need is a model. So this is a, uh, one architecture that we are building on. Uh, it's quite popular, it's based on UNET. Uh, UNET is an enc encoder and decoder based, based architecture used, for example, for Im image segmentation with many successes. Uh, the, difference, the differences here is that instead of using normal convolution, convolution we are using so-called partial convolution that, uh, uh, that, that uh, take, takes into account also uh, masks. Uh, I will talk about it later in the next slide. So uh, it more, more or less looks like that. In the encoder part, part we get an image. Then we use a strided convolution. Uh, so the image during the convolution is, during the convolution is uh, down, downscaled. Then we have batch normalization. And we have, let's say, another layer here. Another layer here. And again, convolution strided. So going here in the encoder, we are decreasing the resolution of the image. And we are adding some more feature maps to it. And then in the decoder phase, uh, we do the upscaling. Uh, here, we don't use any kind of uh, transpose convolution or deconvolution. We just use a simple upscaling here and uh, based on the neighbor, near, uh, nearest neighbor approach. And then uh, we do the partial convolution again. Uh, we also have the skip connections, which can be quite important in the case of in painting, because in particular, in the last layer, our model can, uh, can produce the output basing on the whole process image here and reconstructed image here. And also we can, it can take uh, and map the images, the, the original pix pixels from the original image uh, in the area which is outside of the mask. So that's more or less how the archi architecture looks like. Uh, let me tell you a few words about this partial convolution because it's quite quite simple idea. Uh, so actually it's like, it's, it's a simple convolution, but before doing the convolution, uh, we are uh, multiplying our input patch of the image uh, with mask. So everywhere where, where the mask is uh, zero, uh, everywhere where the mask is, uh, we are setting the pixels to zeros, and then we are doing the convolution. Uh, so we are only considering the, um, uh, the, the pixels uh, outside of the masks. And then we are doing the, the normalization because uh, convolution is based on sums. So if we are removing some elements, then we need some uh, normalization component here, which uh, just uh, uh, puts our activations back to the same level uh, in, irrespective of the mask size. Uh, so that's, that's, the, that's the difference with a, uh, with a convolution. And also one important thing is that the mask is also updated. So uh, after each layer, so after each layer, we are updating the mask. Uh, if, we, if we, in one layer, we reconstructed some pixels, so when we are, fr from the point of view of a given pixels, when our receptive field uh, uh, was covering some uh, real pixels in the previous, pre previous layer, not, not the mask, 
then we are able to, uh, to calculate some activation, and then we are, we are updating this, removing mask from this pixel. So we are considering the information, the reconstructed information as a normal information uh, in the subsequent layers. So our mask is shrinking from layer to layer, and then it usually disappears in the encoder part. Uh, okay, so that's, uh, that's how, how this partial convolution works. Uh, okay, I, I, I want also to mention about some other architectures uh, here from, from, from different papers. Th these are two recent approaches, one from Adobe and one uh, from, from the recent NIPS conference. Uh, so you can see some modifications here, like this architecture consists of uh, two, two parts. First, there's the encoder and decoder part, which per performs some uh, coarse uh, reconstruction based only on um, uh, only on, uh, let's say, per, per pixel uh, reconstruction error. And then there is another part of the network we, which performs refinement using some uh, adversarial loss and uh, generative, generative adversarial network uh, framework. Uh, so this is one possible uh, extension. Here another one, uh, this is called uh, multi-column convolution, convolutional neural network, and we have different several different streams, uh, and uh, they, they operate uh, with different filter sizes. So they have different receptive fields. Uh, they take the same input, and then, then at some point they, uh, they are combined with each other, uh, and then the decoding is, is common for, for all, the, all the streams. Uh, and also there are some other layers used, like for example, dilated, for example, dilated convolution here, which is a, a modification of convolution with increased receptive, receptive fields uh, without coming into details. Because as we will see later, receptive fields are, are crucial here uh, in, the in the problem of in-painting. Uh, so okay, that was about uh, the, the architecture. So what else do we need? Of course, we need the loss function to, to, optimize, to optimize our model parameters. Uh, the loss functions in the, the loss function in the original paper is composed on many of many uh, many elements. The first one uh, is based on a simple per pixel uh, per pixel uh, loss, so per pixel per, pi per pixel reconstruction error. Uh, and uh, here we are considering two two elements. One is uh, calculated inside the mask, and another one outside of the mask. So these are two per pixel uh, loss components. We also have something like perceptual loss, uh, which looks at two images, like in this, in this part, the ground truth image and the, the output image, but not in a pixel space, but in a higher level uh, feature space. So we are extracting some features from a pre-trained model, like VGG16 model, for example. Uh, and here we are calculating this part, uh, comparing these features for, for, for two outputs, taking the L1 norm and summing over this Three, three layers here in this case. And also we, we do this not only for our output image, but also for the, the, the so-called composite image, which is composed of uh, the reconstructed, uh, let's say, mask uh, and uh, original pixels put around. Uh, so like here we, in the whole, the whole uh, formulation, we put more attention to the in, uh, inside of mask uh, reconstruction error. Uh, and also there is, there is a similar uh, style loss uh, which is uh, similar to perceptual loss, but before taking the L1 norm, we are uh, per performing autocorrelation using some gram matrix, uh, and then after the autocorrelation, we, we do the same, more or less, with some normalization factor depending on the size of our feature map taken from VGG, which is number of channels, height and width of our feature map. And these two components, perceptual loss and style loss, there are, there are used also in other problems, like style transfer, for example, and they are more, uh, more in line with human perception than, than the simple uh, reconstruction error from, from the previous component. Uh, and the last component here, that's total variation loss, which is also quite popular in other applications. It is a kind of a penalty for non-smooth output. So we are, uh, uh, we are uh, calculating it it, we are calculating it in the area P, which is our mask slightly enlarged, slightly enlarged by, by a dilation operation. And here we want, to, to, we want the output to be smooth inside the mask and on the boundary between the mask and the original, original image. So the total loss looks 
some, something like, like this. Uh, so this is, the, the, this is a simple weighted, uh, weighted sum of the whole, whole of these components. These are weights taken directly from, from, from the paper, but you have to keep in mind that uh, they depend on many factors. So uh, for example, of course, on your data and on the model that you are used to, to, get to, to compute the perceptual and style loss. So you have to actually uh, tune the, the weights to, to your particular problem and just monitor the, the, um, the contribution of each loss component during the training. Uh, of course, there are some other loss components uh, possible, uh, which we are working on right now and trying to add it to, to, to our pipeline. So as I mentioned already, the adversarial loss can be helpful here, like in this pipeline. In this pipeline, we are training two discriminators, uh, one local, looking at the whole picture, uh, one local looking at the, at the mask, and one global looking at the whole picture, picture, and they are trained to distinguish between original, picture, uh, original images and images generated by our in-painting model, and they are trained together with the generator in a uh, standard adversarial setup, a generative adversarial networks, uh, adversarial networks, networks setup. Uh, so this loss can be quite helpful. Uh, and another kind of loss is IDM, uh, IDMRF loss, introduced in the recent NIPS paper, uh, which is uh, implicit diversified Markov random field loss. So the name is quite, uh, quite uh, impressive, uh, but it's quite uh, interesting as well. So the, 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 without, go, without going into details, uh, the idea is that uh, our reconstructed patches uh, so should be similar uh, to the uh, nearest neighbors of, of there, of, uh, of these patches, uh, in the original image. So we are taking a patch, we are looking for some nearest neighbor in a feature space, so in a higher level feature space, and then we want our reconstructed uh, output, like grass in this case, look like the real grass around. And also it is constructed, the loss is constructed in a way that uh, this is the, the diversified part of the name. So we don't want one patch from the, from the original image to be repeated many times. We want to look for different patches around, all similar but all different, and we want our, our output to be realistic and also diversified, not, not a simple re repeating pattern. So we are also adding this to, to our model right now. Uh, okay, so um, that's more or less the whole pipeline. So then we start we, having these components, data, model, and loss. We train with, uh, with standard SGD algorithms like Adam, for example. Uh, the problem is that we, in this, with this architecture, training time is quite long. So it, with, on the whole ImageNet data, for example, it takes a week to train, to train a reasonable model on a single GPU uh, machine. Uh, so let me come right now to, to some practical issues that I would like to uh, share with you here. Uh, so the first one is with batch normalization. In general, masks uh, cause some problems with, uh, with, uh, with batch normalization because various uh, mask sizes in general affect uh, activation distributions. Um, and you can observe it as a as several problems. So, for example, you can observe. I'm not sure if you are able to see it, but this kind of artifact. So, in the place of masks, you see some uh, non-smoothnesses and some uh, some kind of this artifacts here. Uh, so, this is an example of uh, batch normalization related uh, artifact. Another problem is that actually our model uh, tr uh, treats the boundaries of the image also as masks. And there is a problem if you train the model in a lower le resolution, like 500 per, per, per 500 pixels, for example. And then, as it is a fully uh, co convolutional model, you can apply it to, to a higher resolution. Uh, but then, when the model is processing the input of the image, the, the middle part, then uh, it gets some different activations, uh, because it is used to seeing a boundary around. And here, there is no boundary. There is still image, so the activations slightly differ. And in this extreme uh, case, when we do the reconstruction without a mask, with an with a, uh, empty mask, we see that uh, here some problems with, uh, with uh, normalization also are visible. Uh, so what we can do about it? Uh, first of all, and this, this was proposed in the original paper uh, that I mentioned, uh, we can use two-phase training. So first we do the training with batch normalization, and then we uh, 
we freeze batch normalization layers, uh, the le learnable, trainable parameters of the batch normalization in the encoder part, and then we do the fine tuning with the batch normalization freeze. So the model can just uh, adapt itself to these different, different activations coming from different masks. Uh, that's, that's one technique. Then we observe that also uh, using diversified masks, uh, mask sizes, including also empty masks, can, can help with this. Uh, then, of course, you can replace standard batch normalization with some other normal normalizations, like instance normalization, for example, which uh, does the normalization not on batches but on single images. Uh, this could help, but we haven't tried yet. But there are some papers showing that may maybe this, this, this could be a good direction. And also, uh, it's, it's quite a good idea. It can make sense to remove batch normalization uh, layers at all because all of these problems and also some other problems with, with uh, color coherence mentioned in many, many papers. Uh, the, some recent papers uh, removed the batch normalization completely and it, is, it can make sense also because usually with these kind of models we are training on small batches. So because the model size is huge, uh, we are training with a size on a single GPU, we can, we can train uh, using the batch size of four, for example, which where the benefits of batch normalizations are not that uh, visible. So it also works without batch normalization actually quite, quite well. Now I, I would like to tell you about several issues which are related to high resolution in painting. Uh, and what is high resolution in painting? Uh, most of the papers claim that they do actually high resolution, so they call 512, per high, high, 512 pixels a high resolution because the uh, the first works on in painting were on much, much smaller images, like 64 per 64 pixels, for example. But if you're a smartphone or smart TV manufacturer, manufacturer like TCL, for you, high, high resolution is at least this one. <laughs> and there are some problems up here because moving from this resolution to this resolution even, so uh, only, only changing it uh, twice in a single dimension, then we have four times longer prediction time because it is proportional to the number of pixels. Uh, and also the memory comp consumption is, uh, is uh, bigger for, for this. So the first problem is with CPU and memory, on, especially on the mobile devices, and what, what can we do about it? Of course, we, we can reduce the model size and train smaller models. Uh, we can optimize the model uh, for, for inference. In, for example, we can use the quantization techniques and move from higher precision to lower precision, and in our calculations uh, during, during prediction. We can also optimize the critical, uh, the critical parts of the inference code, and we also, in our, in our R&D center, we also have a group working on it, so optimizing the, the convolutions and, and so on for mobile devices. Uh, and we are also extensively uh, trying to uh, verify the possibility of uh, launching our models on mobile devices using their, their GP, GPU and DSP, so digital signal processing uh, units. So for example, Qualcomm claims that you can uh, receive, you can get up to eight times speed up using the DSP processor. Uh, so we are trying with this, but it's, you have to know that it's not that simple actually to use this DSP. Uh, even if, you are the, if we are the phone manufacturer, we need to use some uh, develop, developers boards. Uh, it's not that simple to, to just run it on a, on a normal phone and test it. Uh, yes, and whenever possible, probably you should do the in painting in lower resolution, so you, you should play with some crops uh, and rescaling techniques and maybe super resolution in your pipeline just to avoid high level resolution because it's just expensive. And not only it's expensive, but it's, uh, it's also difficult. Uh, so uh, another problem related to, uh, to higher resolution is big masks problem. We call it big masks problem because uh, when we, we have the same picture, the same image, like here, and we try to remove this mountain. There is a mountain here, actually. Uh, in this resol resolution, it's much simpler, and it work works better, better than in the case of a higher resolution, because here we need to reconstruct uh, many, many more pixels, and then it's, it becomes really difficult for a model. So uh, how can we help this? Basically, uh, we need to increase the receptive fields uh, of our models, uh, we can uh, achieve this by uh, increasing the size of the conv convolutional filters or increasing the number of layers. Uh, but again, this is expensive. And, or we can use some uh, other, other kind of 
modifications of convolutional layers, like as I mentioned, a delating convolution. Uh, or we can play with architectures. I also mentioned about it. So we can use some uh, initial co cores, uh, part of the network, and then again, uh, refining a network. Uh, or this multi-stream model with uh, different sizes of receptive fields from small to, to bigger ones. Uh, and the last problem related to high resolution, uh, I'm talking about this high resolution because it's really important from the practical point of view if you want to apply it uh, with, in your product, is a detailed textures issue. So what, what, what looks nice in a lower resolution, as I mentioned, most models, most publications show results in this resolution, then it becomes unacceptable if you move to the higher resolution. So like here, we are reconstructing, reconstructing this part this part uh, of the image, and we clearly see the difference be between the reconstructed level of detail and the, the, the texture around. So somehow we need to address it, address it as well. Uh, so first of all, we should train on high resolution images, at least on crops of high resolution images, of course. Uh, and then right now we are playing, as I mentioned, a lot with different, with different uh, loss functions. For example, this adversarial loss is quite promising here because you know, the discriminator trying to distinguish between real and generated photos, it should learn somehow to detect this, this artifact, these patterns here inside. And then uh, our generator in a generative adversarial training should learn to fool the discriminator so it should avoid this kind of patterns. So be, we believe that this can, this can help. Also this MRF-like uh, loss uh, seems to be a good idea to, to improve here. And also, as I mentioned, we can uh, combine in painting with some other techniques like super resolution, for example. So uh, we can use either super resolution as a post-processing or we can uh, build in a super resolution to our model. There's specialized super resolution for the in painting. That's one idea. Uh, and after all, if, if nothing helps, then we can do some post-processing. And it is also post-processing similar to traditional techniques. So then after, after finishing in painting, uh, we can somehow analyze our patches and look for, search for some similar patches around and maybe try to blend the original high resolution patches with our reconstructed patches to, to make it more realistic. Okay, the last, the last issue I, I want to mention uh, is the issue of, ma of mask generation. Uh, so in fact, you may need some special kind of masks and you can use many techniques like semantic segmentation, object mating, uh, silent object detection, face, facial landmark detection to generate some kind of special, specialized mask on objects on our particular uh, elements of faces. And what can you use it for? Of course, for automatic scene editing. It would be a nice feature if you don't need to uh, draw a mask, you just point an object and it disappears from your photo. So it's quite, quite obvious. And also during training, you can use these uh, smart masks to, uh, let's say, make your training more in line with the business application. So if you want to remove objects in your, with your model, in your business application, then you can use this, this mask at, the, at least to fine tune your model. And similar in the cases of faces, if you want to do the in painting and face retouching, removing some uh, defects of, or wrinkles on faces, then probably you don't need to train your model to reconstruct uh, eyes and nose because that's much, much more difficult. Uh, and maybe people don't want to just reconstruct their the, the, the eyes because then they don't look that similar to, 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 to them. Uh, so a smart mask can be also helpful. Uh, okay, let me come to some, uh, some examples, uh, some sample results of our in-painting model. Uh, so here are two examples. Uh, we have a nice scene here on the left. We want to remove some people and some buildings from that scene because we don't like them. And this is the, the output generated by, by our model. Uh, it looks pretty nice. Uh, just remember it's in low resolution, so it's 512 for 512. Here you have the Lewandowski family. <laughs> this, <laughs> you, also have, you also have Clara here. Uh, and you can just uh, remove it from the picture if you, if you don't like it. You prefer Lewandowski without Clara, for example. And this is actually a nice, nice example showing a uh, benefit of uh, of deep learning approach, because if you do the same with a classical approach, some strange uh, things happen, 
because they, they usually the classical approach tries to get some, uh, f some patches from the neighborhood. And what you can see is, uh, I don't have an example here, but you can see the third, the third leg of Lewandowski, for example, in this play. So it's, that also shows how, how, how it works. And as I'm not planning to sell it to you right now, so I also show some uh, more difficult uh, and not that beautiful results. So we, still work, we are still working on improving this. Like here we are removing the, the lamp uh, and, uh, and something. And the, the result is also different than the neighborhood details around. I mentioned about it. And here we are removing a big object, a table, in a quite complex scene. And uh, we get something like this. So when you look, your first look may, may say, OK, it's quite OK. There is a floor and, and so on. But when you look closer, you will, you will see some strange artifacts. And also, this chair here is not reconstructed perfectly. So still, there is a, there is a big, um, big uh, place for improvement here. Uh, and OK, some face example, uh, face in painting examples. Actually, it really works well. So we trained uh, the face model on uh, celebrities' photos. And as you can see, the reconstruction is really nice. So we can reconstruct complex semantic parts of faces like nose and eyes in a realistic way. So this is original. This is in painted just looking on into this image. And also, we can use this model to, to do the face retouching. Like in this case, we are uh, smoothing the area uh, under the eyes and removing some wrinkles. And we get a smooth celebrity face out of your face. <laughs> so that's, that's the idea. OK, let me summarize uh, quickly. So in painting, uh, is a cool and useful topic. Uh, and it can be solved with deep learning, uh, as I showed. Uh, and uh, it's worth to remember that there's a long way or always from the initial results from the paper uh, to production if you want to actually make a function for, for a smartphone, for example, for a smartphone gallery, for example. Uh, and also, uh, I would like you to remember that we are doing some pretty cool projects uh, in TCL Research Europe. So if you are interested, don't hesitate to visit our web page or contact me di directly. Or we have a stand one floor up from here where, when, where you can talk to us at any break and be between, the break, between the breaks as well. OK, thank you very much. <laughs>